Hello, I'm Kyle Dyer, and welcome to Colorado Inside Out on this Friday, November the 4th, 2022. Election Day is this coming Tuesday, and so as you might expect, the number of early ballots being cast is picking up. Here at Colorado Inside Out, we are entering this final stretch with Patricia Calhoun, the founder and editor of Westward. Also, we have David Kopel, research director at the Independence Institute, Eric Sonderman, a columnist with Colorado Politics, and also Denver and Colorado Springs Gazette. And also tonight we have Amber McReynolds, one of the country's leading experts on election and administration. Amber is the former director of elections for the city and county of Denver and is the current chair of the U.S. Postal Service Board of Governors Election Mail Committee. Patty, last weekend was Halloween, seems like forever ago. Um, there was a lull with ballots coming in, but they are picking up. They are definitely picking up, although not as quickly as they should, because I'm holding this. Sorry, Amber, it's my reminder. Too late to mail them. You're going to have yeah. to drop them off at a drop box or at one of the voting centers. You know, it's interesting because the pace is picking up, but what isn't picking up as quickly is the pace of unaffiliated voters who are really going to decide this election. Right now, you have we have 3.8 million active voters in Colorado out of 4.3 registered voters. Right, 1.7 million of them, over 1.7 million are unaffiliated. And a very small percentage of them have voted compared to the Republicans and Democrats who are almost at a third of a, a million registered in each one. So those, those are gonna be the decision makers in, in eight, the new CD district. They could make the decision in the gubernatorial or Senate race, but I don't see that happening. Those people have gone to their corners already on that, but maybe in the Secretary of State's race. So we could still see a big surge as people look at this big ballot and decide how they're going to fill it out. David, the ballot that includes Colorado House District 51 is tough to talk about with the sudden death of House Minority Leader Hugh McKean, who passed away last weekend, uh, a Republican who worked across party lines. We just hear so many wonderful things about him. Yeah, it was a uh, it's, it's a big loss, uh, not just for Republicans, but for the, the state as a whole. and. and the Democrats, like uh, House Speaker Alec Garnett, also extolled him. Not that they voted the same way very, very often, but they uh, uh, he improved the civility and the the quality of Republican leadership in the the state legislature. Uh, he has a leaves behind a, a son, young son with Down syndrome, which makes it um, all the more sad. A lot of people are expressing condolences right now and and thinking about the loss, but a lot is going to change too with the makeup when the legislature starts. It is, and uh, David nailed it with respect to Hugh McCain. Uh, there are a number of people around the Capitol that, who are respected. There are not that many who are beloved, and, and Hugh McCain actually transcended from just the re respected category to the beloved category. Uh, he was just a decent man, a gentle man, and he put the state above party, and he put his party above craziness, and both of those are in huge demand today and he will be missed. You know, he had just mentioned just a couple of weeks ago in an interview that he was really optimistic that Republicans might, in this election, cut into the Democratic majority at state capitol. Amber, for Republicans to have that happen, as Patty mentioned, they'll need their base to come out, but those undecideds, I would think, as well. Yeah, well, I mean, the majority of voters in Colorado are unaffiliated, so 45% and growing. Um, and a big portion of that, and I'm actually unaffiliated myself, but a big portion of those unaffiliated are younger voters. So the 18 to 24 demographic, 18 to 30, um, has a huge number of unaffiliated voters. In fact, it exceeds 60% uh, in terms of registrations that are coming in. So um, unaffiliated are going to be the deciders in Colorado, not just this election, but future elections to come. And, you know, I think not only the partisan and races to look at, but also on ballot issues. They are they are the, the ones that decide and they'll continue to decide. So I think there's a number of um, very high profile ballot issues that will also be interesting to look at when, when the election results come out. Mm -hmm. Colorado is said to have one of the most secure election systems in the country. Uh, but David, we have that statistic, 50% have doubts against the election outcomes. And then there's the added layer of how the questions and the threats remain uh, in our clerk's offices and at polling sites and polling workers. Vicki Tompkin, Tompkins, the chair of the ever-shrinking official El Paso Repu Repu Republican Party, used her legal authority to pull several of the party's poll watchers uh, 
from their slots. You know, people have been longtime Republican volunteers, good poll watchers. She does have the legal authority to do it, replace them with other Republican poll watchers. But there was no cause, like the person had done anything bad or anything at all. It was just this this little faction she now has demands, she demands that everything be so tightly under her control and people be loyal to her, not loyal, you know, not loyal to the Republican Party. She doesn't even endorse or do anything to assist some Republican candidates. So if you think about why Democrats have been winning statewide for a while, part of that is the El Paso County Party, which is supposed to p produce big numbers that can help a Republican win statewide, uh, hasn't been doing that. Also this week, the president came out and spoke prime time, saying that he is concerned about the amount of candidates in this country running right now who are saying, well, I might not accept the outcome. I think anyone has to be concerned. I'm not sure Joe Biden is the greatest messenger for that, only because he himself has become a polarized figure. And to do this speech five, six days, whatever it was, uh, in advance of the election, you know, obviously sometimes smacks of other motives. But nonetheless, whether it's Joe Biden or anyone else, more people have to be making that case. And you need more Republicans making the case. There is a poison loose in this land, and it's reflected by that poll number you said, Kyle, the 50 percent who lack confidence on our elections. I mean, fortunately, I'm sitting here next to the panel on, on this panel with uh, as much of an expert as this country has on both Democratic voting procedures and just the security of elections. Neither party has covered themselves in glory. Obviously, Stacey Abrams, who's now running against again for governor of Georgia, likely to lose, refused to concede her race back in 2018, even though she lost the race by north of 50,000 votes. We'll see how she fares come Tuesday. But then Donald Trump, in a, it was completely planned. It was calculated. He telegraphed his punch in advance that if he came up short in November of 2020, he was going to basically deny the outcome. And uh, and more or less refuse to leave. And once a poison is let loose in the land, as it's been, it is awfully hard to get it back in the bottle. And that is our challenge, is to restore that fundamental decency and confidence uh, where, you, you know, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. And when you lose, you, you conduct yourself with dignity and honor and you live to fight another day. Amber, let's talk about the legitimacy of the ballot here in Colorado. Uh, when you were in office with Denver, you created the tracking system so we can see where our ballot is and how it's being counted. When you look at what's going on now, what goes through your mind? You know that when that ballot goes in the box, it is secure. Well, that's exactly right, Kyle, and I'm glad you brought up ballot tracking. That did actually start as first in the world in, in Denver, Colorado, and now the entire state has access to that system. And now actually 100 million voters across the country have access to that same technology, and that started here in Colorado. Um, and it does improve accessibility, but it also improves security and accountability of the ballot. And that's, I think, a testament to Colorado. We've built these systems over time to respond to the voters' needs, to meet voters where they are, and then also build security around the system so that people do have trust and confidence. And the unfortunate thing, uh, and you mentioned this um, a few minutes ago, is, is that leaders have, the reason that voters have distrust is because the leaders that they follow have been uh, lying to them about the outcome of, of the 2020 election. And so democracy very much is on the ballot. It's on the ballot every single election cycle. And I, I, I have full confidence that voters will make good decisions. They, they, we have to trust voters to do that. And certainly the heroes of the day are the election officials on the front lines that are working tirelessly right now to process ballots, uh, deliver election results timely. Um, but we also have to give them the space and the time and make sure they have the resources to get it right so that we can have trust. And, and I, I have full confidence in Colorado election officials um, and their ability to run this election and, and deliver for the people of Colorado. Patty, I'm curious, is in charge of Westward, do you cover election night election result coverage differently than you might have 10, 15 years ago because of the mood of the country? No, we still cover it from a bar if possible. The thing about election <laughs> counting is we know this year, even if the ballots are counted quickly, and in Colorado sometimes that works in some easy elections, but other times it's going to take 24, sometimes even later if it's close hours. 
I have complete faith in Colorado's election system, and I think mo everyone should. I mean, you look at what Amber has done. You look at what the other county clerks have done. You look at Wayne Williams, who lost but was still willing to go forward, our former Secretary of State, to, was willing to go out with incumbent Jenna Griswold and talk about how secure the system is. So you have a state that is the gold standard, but you still are able to have someone like Tina Peters go wacky with Mike Lindell and the small percentage of the country, but still a sizable percentage of the country that thinks it's completely rigged. And then 50% maybe think it's not going to be something they can believe. So this year, I think we will have debates going on across the country and challenges. So when it's over and the count's done and the counts might be completely accurate, you will have people complaining yeah. and asking for recounts, hopefully not in Colorado. Let's hope. Um, you mentioned Secretary of State's office. Eric, the once considered low key race for the Secretary of State's office is anything but that in many states, not just Colorado. Um, this race has become, this position has become very political. Uh, in Colorado, I mean, Pam Anderson, in many cases, the Republican candidate, has been the only Republican where a number of editorial boards, including the Denver Post, which endorsed almost all Democrats, but then endorsed Pam Anderson as the lone Republican. And all that said, and Jenna Griswold has taken more than her share of hits on editorial pages and in the media, and I've delivered a few of those hits because I found her wanting in some respects. But if you turn on your television, Jenna Griswold is there hour after hour after hour with well-produced ads, millions of dollars of ads, and Pam Anderson is nowhere to be found on TV, and ultimately I think that's the determining factor. Amber, as someone who is heavily involved in this process, how do you feel about the Secretary of State's office being becoming so politicized? Well, I think it's it's it presents a number of challenges, not not only in Colorado but um, nationally. And uh, most secretaries are in fact elected in a partisan election in this country. Some are appointed, some are not. Uh, years ago, when we had uh, Secretary of State Scott Gessler, there was actually a report written by Ethics Watch that presented three different models uh, that would move the Secretary of State's races to perhaps the coordinated ballot as a nonpartisan race, or perhaps be a cabinet uh, separate department. Um, from any elected offices. So there's, I think we have to continue to have that conversation, look at the best structures. Uh, there might be better ways to do it, um, given that these races have certainly become partisan, even though they are administrative, they're technical, they're operational. Uh, this is not really, a, a, and it should not be at all, a partisan, a partisan operation. And most secretaries do not operate in a partisan way across the country. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Yes. Um, in this race and also the other races throughout the country. Um, we should stress, though, too, the Secretary of State's office has nothing to do with the actual counting of ballots. I think, David, you might have mentioned that last week. Uh, we can't stress that enough. Well, Jeb, Jen is clearly the future not only for Secretary of State, but uh, further in Colorado politics because she is an absolute fundraising monster, power, hulk. She is the chair of something called the Democratic Secretary of State's Association, <clears throat> which is a political action committee that raises money for Democratic Secretaries of State. She took over that in 2021, and since then, she has multiplied by 10 the amount of money they have. So they've got $25 million that they're investing in races all over the country, including certainly her own. The money comes from them, Go gets takes three steps before it ends up in, in a campaign commercial for her. But, you know, uh, I think that's one of the reasons the Democratic Party establishment puts up with her, because it, it is well known in Colorado government circles that for actually running the Secretary of State's office, she's incompetent. Her staff turnover is massive. She repeatedly likes, twice she sent out voter registration forms to people who weren't registered to vote and says it was a glitch, you know, she's done that twice. We had a long tradition of secretaries of state, even when they were interesting people, actually behaving in office in a boring way. She is the opposite. She is a publicity hound. She took the COVID relief money to, to put out campaign, in effect, campaign commercials about how wonderful she is. Um, but I don't think that delegitimizes voting for Secretary of State. The voters got it right many, many times. 
they made one mistake, it doesn't mean elections are bad. Okay, all right. Um, let's just go through and just bring up things that we think will, that we're keeping an eye on for election night. And Amber, I'd like to start with you and 2C in Fort Collins, which calls for ranked choice voting. Are we expecting that to pass? Is that something that could go across the state? Other states are looking at it. And it has, it's all tied to the amount of unaffiliated voters. Yeah, so they're, they're, um, 2C in Fort Collins is on the ballot, uh, and that would be making ranked choice voting available in municipal elections there. It's already passed in Broomfield and, and also Boulder, and there's a few other municipalities that it has advanced across the, the uh, state. And the legislature also made it um, legal in municipal elections last year. Um, and there's also legislation that's that's being worked on to look at ranked choice voting for our presidential primaries. And this is an issue I've been working on nationally because when you have a presidential primary and you have 20 candidates, say the Republicans had a, a good number in 2016, Democrats did in 2020, when you have a state like ours where we're later in the process, we end up with candidates on the certified ballot that ultimately drop out by the time the election happens. And so there's lost votes. In fact, in 2020, more than 3 million Democratic votes were lost in their process just because people voted for candidates that were off the ballot by the time the election happened. So there's some real advantages to ranked choice voting in that scenario, and there's certainly advantages in the municipal level when you have multiple candidates. So I, I could see it passing in Fort Collins, and, and I certainly would like to see it expand um, because I think it solves a lot of, it provides a lot of solutions. And how to many, I'm sorry, officials. how many ranks would you do? Like, well, so it depends. So that's a policy choice as well, and it depends on the type of, of race. But in the presidential primary, for instance, um, because delegates are allocated, the states that used it in 2020, and there were five that did, they didn't limit you to, uh, to ranking because uh, you take the percentages of delegates and allocate those. So they allowed people to do that. And it was great because those voters in states that had it didn't, didn't lose their votes for choosing a candidate that ultimately dropped out. Um, so there's a lot of positive uh, aspects of it, and I certainly want to see it expand. I think Fort Collins, it certainly could pass. Um, and then there's another election issue in Denver, uh, 2L, referred question 2L, which is improving the blue book process in Denver. And there were, there were some mistakes in that process that happened this time, mainly due to the time crunch that currently occurs. And, and that 2L question hopefully will pass and improve that blue book process for local issues in Denver. Okay. Patty, what are you keeping an eye on? I mean, you still have your ballot sitting here, so. I do. Well, do part of it is Denver is complicated. It has some really tricky issues beyond 2L. You have the sidewalk issue. You have the eviction fund issue, which would, you know, fi um, charge landlords to put in money so you would have guaranteed representation. You have waste um, issues and recycling issues. It is going to take people time to study those issues. If you haven't started yet, get going because Den these are things that could be very close in Denver and they're going to change how much you spend and how you live your life in Denver. <coughs> Statewide, there's some initiatives. I think 122, the psychedelic mushroom issue, which is giving, bringing us lots of national attention. That one could be fairly close. It, it, it I think it might go down now. People are getting a little um, more prudy about it. But you also have 123 with the affordable housing. We're gonna be watching that closely. So I think how people are gonna vote for the candidates is pretty clear to them now. It won't take that long to make your decision if you haven't voted. But the initiatives, both statewide and Denver, they're gonna to be tough. Mm -hmm. David, is there one race that you're keeping an eye on? Well, I'm, I'm on back to the, the ballots coming in and, and Patty's point yeah. about uh, a lot of unaffiliateds haven't voted. There was a new poll this morning that showed O'Day just two points down from Bennett. And so if O'Day is gaining substantially with unaffiliateds and they ultimately do come out and vote, um, that get, gives him the upset chance. So I'm definitely watching that one. Um, in Boulder, I'm watching uh, Measure 6C, which is, uh, in my view, an attack on our Boulder Public Library. It would take the Boulder Public Library out of the hands of the city of Boulder and consolidate it with Long, you know, uh, Lafayette and all those places that the people in Boulder are afraid of uh, in a one huge library district uh, and then would raise property taxes to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's not like the people in the city of Boulder are going to pay anything less in taxes uh, when the, the city stops funding it. Uh, so I, I hope the library 
pr uh, survives in its current form and, and that measure loses. Eric? I think I'll wrap this up by going back to where Amber started. And uh, I agree with everything she said about ranked choice voting. I'll be intrigued with uh, the election in Fort Collins, but I'm intrigued with the possibility of this coming on a statewide level at some point in the future. It's not imminent, but Colorado has long led the way in various kinds of political reform. And whether it is ranked choice voting or a top two system, such as California and Washington State employ, where you have two candidates and even in a Democratic district, the November election might not be a Democrat versus a Republican, but a moderate Democrat versus a more extreme Democrat or something like that. I think there are models out there that could drive politics, at least at the margins, away from the extremes and a little bit more in a centrist direction and any models like that are worth considering and worth supporting. And, you know, I'll see what unfolds over the coming years. All right, everyone, now it's time for our lightning rounds that run down Colorado's highs and lows of this week. So, Patty, low point for you. It does not get any lower than House District 15, where the man who is going to win is the well-named Pastor Bottoms, who believes everyone is demonic who might be slightly left of Attila the Hun. He thinks the FBI caused the insurrection at, on January 6th, of course, is want everyone who is pro-choice is demonic. And this is a man who is going to win. <clears throat> and we will be talking about this Colorado legislature as the disgrace for the next four years. Oh, OK. And he uses that word a lot. Demonic. demonic. OK. All right. David. Joe Biden, with all his pieties about democracy on the ballot, uh, is endorsing in Georgia an election denier, Stacey Abrams, who showed prove to Donald Trump that you can flagrantly deny an election with no basis and a bunch of dolts in your party will love it and stick with you anyway. He's endorsing her against Brian Kemp, the governor who stood up to Trump's attempt to steal the election. And by the way, Stacey Abrams is already pre-denying the upcoming election, and but she's been topped by Hillary Clinton, who denied 2000, 2004, and 2016. And now she's ahead of the curve, because she's a Clinton. She's already denying the 2024 election. <laughs> okay, Eric? Where to go? There's so much election <laughs> stuff, but let me go elsewhere okay. to our predictable Denver Public Schools. There is a critic out there of Denver Public Schools, prominent African-American in Northeast Denver named Brandon Pryor. Sometimes Pryor's tactics and rhetoric might be over the top, but last I looked, uh, the First Amendment still applied. Then DPS sent him a letter recently demanding he cease and desist from his free speech, if you will, avoid all school buildings, avoid school board meetings, whatever. Uh, somebody needs to... Uh, send the DPS school board and senior administration a copy of the First Amendment. Okay, Amber. Well, I think for certainly the continued attacks on election officials, I mean, this is happening to my colleagues and friends across the country, whether it's voice messages, text messages, social media posts, or what have you. Um, and I would encourage everyone that's, that's watching not only to vote, but to thank election officials for what they're tirelessly working on across the state right now and across the country. Um, and, and I think also, you know, the things that are feeding that are also a low point and continue to be a low point every single week, whether it's radio hosts that are, are continuing to spread lies um, and encourage those attacks, but it's, it's continuing, it's happening, uh, and, it, and it, is, it is something that I think is just a low point for our entire, our entire uh, way of life here in, in, in the United States. I agree with you. All right, let's talk about something positive, shall we? Don't be demonic, Kyle. Okay, Fill I'll out try. your ballot. If you haven't already, then go out this weekend, deposit it in a Dropbox, and go to Denver Arts Week. There's oh, yes. so many hundreds of great mm -hmm. events going on this weekend. So you can do your civic duty in a non-demonic way, and then go <laughs> enjoy yourself. Okay, David? The county clerks uh, all over the state are whether they're Democrats or Republicans or whatever, uh, have a continue, the vast majority of them, to be excellent. They are generally boring and highly competent, and they're the ones who are counting the votes and making sure the election works properly, and they, uh, they do a great job. We like boring in this yes. case, right? Yes. yes, Eric. Couldn't agree more with David and with Amber's point in terms of election officials and those who are making this machinery work. They deserve all the credit. To preview my column that's running this weekend, we give all the credit to the winners of these elections. 
I want to give some credit to those who lose. It's part of the enterprise. For every winner, there's one or more losers. And particularly for those losers who behave in the appropriate manner, graciously concede the race, concession speeches in this day and age are more important than victory speeches. Mm -hmm. I agree. Amber. Um, for me, voters, make sure you turn your ballot in sooner rather than later. That actually helps election officials track it also through the system. Um, share that you voted on social media. Uh, we want to overtake Minnesota in terms of, of the highest turnout. So everybody in Colorado needs to engage. Um, election officials continue to give me optimism every single day. Um, so please thank them as you vote. Uh, encourage them and, and share good stories about them and their amazing work because they are they are awesome. And then journalists that are covering, covering elections. We don't often thank them enough for the work they do as part of this democracy. And I think uh, journalists at the local level are key to also educating the public about this process. Yes, I think collectively we're giving out love to everyone who's been working so hard for this election season. So yes, thank you all. Thanks everybody, thanks panel, thanks everybody at home for watching. Now it is your turn to be heard. If you haven't already, you gotta go vote. And make sure to catch us next Friday night when we dissect the outcome of the various races and navigate what's in store for Colorado going forward. And once we get out of election season, we're really going to encourage you at home to get involved with our show. We'll tell you how in the weeks to come. In the meantime, we welcome your thoughts and your ideas, so please reach out to us on our social media pages or email us at cio at pbs12.org and share this show with your friends. It can be seen anytime on pbs12.org or on our YouTube channel. My name is Kyle Dyer. Thanks so much for watching us here on Colorado Inside Out. I will see you next Friday night at 8 right here on PBS 12.